Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start with a story. So uh, this story take place, uh, takes place in, a, in the school that I founded and where I teach. So a couple of months ago, uh, four or five students of our second grade started a science project. And the project was to understand the life cycle of a plant. So they had some hypotheses in their mind, what does a plant need to survive and flourish? They, they thought it needs sunlight, it needs water and air and soil. So they went about testing this um, hypothesis. So what they did was they prepared three different plant pots and put some plants in each of them and then placed these plants in uh, different locations on the campus. They put one directly in the sunlight, they put one in a dark room, and they put one in a refrigerator. Now the refrigerator happens to be in our dining area where I go every day to have lunch with my kids and, and all the other uh, teachers. What would happen every day was they would go to the refrigerator, pull it open, check the plant, observe it, put it back in. This happened for one, two, three, four days. Every day the same routine, open the fridge, uh, check the plant, put it back in. And then the fifth day I, lo I, I couldn't resist my curiosity. So I called them, I asked, what do, you, what do you expect to see? What's going to happen? And one of the girls says, the plant is supposed to die, but it's not dying. I, and and I was, when I saw the plant, it was very clear that the plant was clearly not enjoying its time in the refrigerator. So I thought, what do you expect to see? What is going to happen? What do you mean the plant is going to die? Is it going to disappear? Is it going to change its color? Is it going to stop growing? What is going to happen? And that got all these kids really confused because they hadn't thought about what it means to die for this plant. They didn't have any mental model of what dying means for, for the plant. And that got me really curious. I asked them if it changes its color, if it changes to brown or black, uh, it does not disappear. So the plant is still there. Is it still dead or is it still alive? What do you mean when it's alive and when it's dead? If it stops growing, does it mean it, it is dead because it has stopped growing? This, this incident kind of galvanized the thought that I had in my mind uh, since a long time, but particularly since uh, when I started the school and started teaching young kids, that how we are fed the idea of change, particularly the idea of uh, rapid change. Right? Uh, there is a Norwegian philosopher, uh, Guton Floystad, who says, we all agree that everything changes. The rate of change always increases. You better hurry up, otherwise you're going to lose out. You better hurry up. That's the message of the world today. We all need to hurry up. Right? That's what we are told. But we need to remind ourselves and remind everybody around us that there are some things that don't change. Things like needing to belong. Things like needing to be taken care of. Needing to be loved and be appreciated. These things don't change. But we live in a society which is powered by technology with its instantaneous tools. We need everything extremely instantaneously. We need togetherness, slowness, and reflection to feel the need to be loved, to feel the need to be appreciated. And the only way to find this slowness and reflection and togetherness is to be in sync with the timescales of the world, to, in the timescales of nature. We've lost that sense of, we've lost the temporal sense of the world. So to, to kind of address this, to get students in the temporal scale of nature, temporal scale of the world around them, how do they get in sync with how the time scales of nature work? We started a horticulture program, a program where they grow, they grow plants. Now, nothing in horticulture or gardening is instantaneous. The seeds take days to germinate. The plant takes weeks, maybe months, to mature. Kids having planted their own vegetables and grains have to wait. There's no switch that make the make, that's going to make the plant grow up. There's nothing they can do. They have to wait, they have to observe, and they have to nurture for it to do something. What we need to realize that to be and find that sense of slowness, that sense of togetherness and reflection, we need to be in the timescales of the world, timescales of the natural world. And we really don't get, particularly our kids and now us, we don't get 
that experience of transient. We don't get that experience of slowness in, in the world around us. Everything has to be very quick. Right? And that's something that we're really missing uh, in, our, in our society, particularly in our schools. At the, Herman Hesse said that we live in the time of digest. Digest meaning we want everything to be condensed to its common denominator. We want everything to be condensed to its simplest form for people to digest it, for people to understand it. That is not a compliment. That was the reflection of our times. As a society and as, as an education system, we value the completion of concepts against the understanding of ideas. We confuse faster as better, and we confuse efficiency as effectiveness. They're not the same. They're very different, and we need to distinguish those concepts. Similarly, in those lines, what we have experienced, and what I have personally experienced, is our growing inability to keep complex thoughts in our head. Because we live in this, this age of digest, we are not able to keep complex thoughts in our head. You would have seen kids, they need to jump from one thing to the other very quickly. Right? We are not able to keep, let alone doing one thing at a time, we are not able to hold really complex thoughts in, in our heads. And then we have this habit of offloading. We offload our cognitive work to devices, to other people. For example, I, don't, I do understand and I don't mind, and I actually support, offloading of, say, something like a mathematical operation to a calculator. We should offload it. Somebody reminding me that I have a meeting at 10, 10 a.m., my smartphone does that. That is a good offloading. You can do that. You should do that. But what our kids don't know and what we as a society don't know, where to stop that offloading. We extend that habit of offloading onto more complex matters onto matters that are decidedly humane. We are in this age where we get inundated, deluged with information. Some information is true, some is fake, some is biased, some is objective. We are inundated with information. But we don't have the tools, particularly our kids, don't have the tools, they don't have the mental approach to strengthen their minds, to strengthen their minds to use critical thinking to use authentic approaches to understand these matters. And what happens is, by extending that habit of offloading, they and we all offload what we should be doing ourselves. We don't appraise issues on ourselves. We are not able to think for ourselves. We wish and we expect others to do their, our thinking on our behalf. They do it. We just digest it. We just get their thinking. Now, to address that, we started a program, we started a philosophy program in school. Now, philosophy and school don't go hand in hand. We think that philosophy is difficult, philosophy is something impractical, philosophy is something old people do uh, when they don't have anything of more practical value to be done. There is some, some truth to it, but not much. There's so much we can do at school. And what we have seen is how much students are able to contribute with their own ideas, with their own thoughts, if they are given the chance. This program is called Noesis. In, in this program, we are a community. We are a community who is dedicated to liberal education. We are a community whose goal is to find fundamental knowledge and see the unifying ideas to see the unifying ideas of ideas across the world. And the kind of stuff that we read, the kind of books that we study, the kind of, uh, we primarily do works of art, but particularly the written word. That's, that's, we feel there's something that's really missing in our, in our society. We study books, we study works of art, which are both timely, but also timeless. They're both timely and timeless. And I have to make a distinction here about what kind of philosophy we do. We do not study new age, motivation, uh, self-help kind of work, which masquerades as philosophy. We do real hard philosophy, which puts real demands, real intellectual demands on kids. We don't patronize kids by saying that, OK, this is something easier. Let's do this with you. No, we do stuff that adults. Uh, at university level or even beyond uh, would do. But we give them scaffolds. We present it in such a way that everybody can access it. 
That's the point. We don't want to patronize kids. We read everything from ancient Greek, say Socrates or Plato, to uh, modern philosophers of Hume or Nietzsche. We use ancient uh, Indian works and works of the East to modern uh, Western giants from Dostoevsky to Le Guin. And by doing this, we have realized that how critical thinking and how thinking on your own is difficult. It's so difficult. But once you do it, you start seeing the world in a different light. You start seeing the world in the way it is and how you perceive it. John Dewey said that no attempt at social reform can succeed through educational means if the society is not ready to accept it. Society cannot change by an educational medium if it is not ready to be changed. Nothing that we do in education will be successful if the society itself is not ready to accept that change. And now, more than ever, we need students, and by extension, all of us, to really inquire and understand the greatest ideas of the world. That's what we need uh, at this point in, in, in the world. Just to sum it up, to be able to find slowness, togetherness, and reflection, we need to be in temporal harmony with nature. We need to come face to face with nature. You can't just read about nature in books or see it on television. We need to come face to face with it to understand the closeness to earth, to understand the value of manual labor. That will bring us close to ourselves and to nature. And similarly, we need to get face to face with each other to find some common ground, to find that we are all uh, in the same problems or in the same good areas. We need to be face to face to find that. And unless we do that, we won't be able to find harmony with nature or ourselves. The moment we are face to face with nature and ourselves, that will make the world a better place for us, for our kids, and for every element of nature. Thank you.